Thank you. So last week we talked about this idea. And we know that people thought you could, in certain situations, get non-living things to turn into living things. We know now it's false. But what we want to talk about are some of the experiments that help people <coughs> understand that. Okay? So the first thing we'll talk about is this gentleman, a scientist named Francesco Reddy. He was an Italian scientist. He was uh, doing his research in the middle of the 1600s. And Reddy did an experiment in which he wanted to know um, about maggots. So the question he was asking, the problem, if you will, in his experiments, you want to know where these maggots came from. People knew that if you just left a piece of meat out, after just a couple days, maggots would appear. These little crawling worm-like creatures. You want to know where they came from. Many people thought, well, the meat turns into maggots after a certain amount of time. But Reddy had a different idea. Reddy's idea was that these maggots that are here on the meat are actually coming from flies. That was his hypothesis. People know if you left a piece of rotting meat out, it flies all clustered around it. And he thought it's from these flies is where the maggots came from. So he just did a very simple experiment. Um, Reddy had a couple different jars in which he put a chunk of meat in there. And just let it out. Now one of the jars was open. One of the jars, the top was covered with gauze material, like cheesecloth, like a, a netting sort of material. And then one was completely covered, okay? sealed tight. And Reddy left these for a little while and then made some observations. And what he observed is that there were maggots on the meat okay. in the cut open jar. There were not any maggots on the meat in the netted jar. And there were no maggots on the sealed jar either. So the open jar, he saw flies going into the meat laying their eggs. In the screen jar, the flies were there. They were attracted to the jar still, but they couldn't get to the actual meat. They did lay their eggs on the screen. And maggots did appear on the screen, but not in the meat. sealed up jar, there were no maggots. So, what do you think about his hypothesis? Maggots come from flies. If you're looking at these observations, what do you think about that hypothesis? What was his conclusion? David? His hypothesis was correct. Maggots do come from flies. If meat had been able to turn into maggots, what would you expect from the results of this experiment? what people thought was actually correct. And which one? Oh. Yeah. If the meat was actually turning into maggots, we'd expect maggots to have formed on all three of those. 
they didn't. The magnets were only there when the flies were attracted and laid their eggs, either on the meat or on the screen itself. So Reddy's experiment told us that meat does not turn into maggots. Maggots are fly larvae. Just like a butterfly larva is a caterpillar, a fly larva is a maggot. Flies lay their eggs on a food source, like meat. They hatch, and when they hatch, they hatch these little maggots. The maggots eat lots of this rotting food, and then eventually change into flies. So Reddy was one important scientist. Another was a, another Italian scientist, Lazzaro Spallanzani. He did a different experiment. His experiment was in the middle of the 1700s, and what he was looking at is these microbes that grow, grew in broth. You know, soup was a popular food for a long, long time. And people would notice when they had some broth, like chicken broth, for example, that after being left for just a little while, a couple days, all of a sudden it started to turn cloudy, would smell bad, it would make you sick if you ate it. It was a living, growing organism in there called the microbe. Now we would call them bacteria. But people didn't know where they came from. They thought maybe after a certain period of time, the broth turns into these bacteria, these microbes. And so Spallanzani was doing an experiment to try to figure this out. He wanted to know what caused these microbes to appear in the broth. He had his own hypothesis. He felt that it wasn't the broth turning into the microbes. He thought that they came in in the air and settled in the broth and then started growing there. That's what he thought. And so he did an experiment, of course. His experiment was pretty simple. He took some broth. And he heated it up, he boiled it. And he had two different flasks. And one of the flasks, he put a stopper in it. He sealed it up. After he boiled it, he sealed it up and let it sit. And the other flask was exactly the same, but he didn't put a stopper in it. He left it open to the air. The broth that was open to the air, after a couple days, microbes were growing in it. But in the flask that he boiled and then put the stopper in, no microbes grew there. And then after a certain time, he opened it up, letting air back in. And you see, after he did that, then the microbes would start to grow. So what do you think his conclusion was in this experiment? What was his conclusion? Hypothesis is that microbes came from the air. Babe? That his um, hypothesis was correct? Yeah, he was correct. Microbes are, they do come from the air. Because as long as he kept the air out, those microbes never, never appear. If the broth were actually turning into the microbes, what would we expect? What would you expect if the broth actually turned into microbes? Sophia? Right, that they that the broth did turn into them, but that's not what he saw. He saw if he kept the air out, the microbes didn't form. Which need of life? We talked last week about all of the things need certain things. Which need of life was Spellanzani removing? I can sort of think of two here. 
Giuliani showed that these microbes are in the air somehow. Now we have one last scientist to talk about. Louis Pasteur, he was French. He was doing his work in the 1800s. And again, he was asking a similar sort of question. He was asking, where do those microbes come from? Valentani said they're in the air, but Pasteur had another idea. He thought, well, they're not just in the air, floating around on their own. They're actually hitching a ride on little particles of dust. And that's where these microbes are. They're on the dust particles that are spread throughout the air. And so he had a pretty smart idea about how he could figure out if that were true or not. He had a similar setup to Spallanzani. He had some broth, he boiled it. But he made some special flasks to use in his experiment. These flasks at the top had this long curved glass tube called the swan's neck tube. And so what would happen is air could still get in. Because this tube was open, air could get in. But because of the curve, any dust particles would settle in the bottom of the curve. So air could get in, but dust could not get in. So Pasteur boiled the broth again. And then in some of the swan's neck flasks, okay, he let them just stay normal. And when he did, there was no growth in here, no microbes grew. And even though air could get in, the dust was settling here. In the other, he would boil it, then no microbes would form. But then, once he broke the stem off, then microbes began to grow. So, was his hypothesis correct or incorrect? Is it the dust particles or the air that's introducing these microbes? Rania? Yeah, that it is. As long as he kept the dust particles out, no microbes grew. So yes, he did. His hypothesis was correct. And we know this today that bacteria are not so just floating in the air on their own. They're on these little pieces of dust that are all throughout the air. That's where they are. And so we know today, because of these scientists, spontaneous generation is false. Non-living material does not turn into living things. Life only comes from other living things. The bacteria come from other bacteria. The frogs come from frog eggs that hatch in the mud. The mice are attracted to the hay. Flies lay eggs on the meat. None of those examples were actually spontaneous generation. They all had other explanations in which these living things came from other living things. Now, just to give us one last thing here. Uh, we don't have this slide, just to talk about it. So, for a long, long time, People didn't know about um, Pasteur, obviously. He was his research in the 1800s. But people had known some of the ideas that Pasteur confirmed. In fact, people noticed early on that water from streams sometimes made people sick. They drank. But they also realized that if you use the same water, from the same river, same stream, and you used it to brew beer, people did not get sick. Even though it's the same water, people didn't get sick. So the question is why? So why was that the case? In fact, they used to brew 
special beers for children that were lower in alcohol because they knew that it wouldn't make people sick while the water might. Now, why not? Why didn't the beer make people sick, but the water did? Next. You must have added something in the That's a, good, that's a good idea that maybe something they were adding as they were brewing beer made it so people didn't get sick, but it actually wasn't anything special they added. Olivia? So, didn't they boil it in the beer and then they didn't boil it in the regular beer? Yeah, to brew beer, the first step is you boil water along with malted barley and hops and stuff, and you boil that. Okay. And in the boiling process, what was happening? To this water. See? It was yeah, it was because what was being taken away from those bacteria? Um, the well, the germs were there, but what happens when you boil them? They die. They yeah, they, they die. They're not at the proper temperature, they're basically killed. And then they can no longer make people sick. So people didn't understand why this was happening, but as long as you um, <coughs> boil that water and <coughs> used it to brew beer, it would be safe. Now, does anyone know if you ever have like a water main break in your neighborhood or something, and there's a possibility that bacteria have been introduced into the water? What do they tell you to do before you drink it? Boil it? Yeah, there's a thing, it's called the boil water advisory, where before you drink any water from your house, you have to boil it first. Or if you're out and you are camping or something, you have some water that you're unsure of whether it has bacteria in it. You can boil it first, and by boiling it, you kill any microbes, any bacteria that cause you to get sick, and then you can drink it. Well, like, say if you boil it and then you freeze it, and then, like, would the bacteria come back? Good question. Um, so, let me go back a minute. Does this guy's name look familiar? Pasteur. You may have seen it this morning. If you're eating cereal or something. Why is it familiar, Lily? Because he's very pasteurized. Yeah, if you have a look on like a carton of milk or something, it says the milk is pasteurized. Have you heard of that word? No. No? If you look at next time, when you go home and look at your milk, look at the label, it'll say that the milk is pasteurized. It comes from his name, Pasteur. Because what do they do? So milk obviously comes from a cow. Okay. You could drink milk directly from a cow. Okay, but if it has to be bottled and sent somewhere, it's gonna be a little while. And so there could possibly be bacteria in that milk. So what do they do to it before they send it off to the grocery store? Ready? Sort of. Not quite brew it, I wouldn't say. Yeah, they they heat it. They heat it up hot enough so that any bacteria that were in that milk can't survive. And then what do they do immediately afterwards? Not well they will eventually, but there's a key thing after, right? They refrigerate it? Even before that. Yeah, because they seal it, right? They, they heat it up and then seal it. As long as it's sealed, no new bacteria is going to be able to get into that milk. Okay? This is also why a can of um, mandarin oranges can sit in your shelf for weeks at a time and not, not spoil. Because those oranges, before they're put in the can, all canned goods are heated up to kill any bacteria and immediately seal. Now what do you have to do with a canned good after you open it? You gotta refrigerate it because as soon as you open it, now what is able to get in? Bacteria from dust that's in the air. And then they can infect it. So it doesn't stay good forever. You have to um so here, top here. So then you have to refrigerate it to, and that's what refrigerating does, it slows down the growth of bacteria. So pasteurization is bringing something to a high temperature to county bacteria and immediately sealing it so that no new bacteria can get in. 
I want to show you a couple things here. 